course, I've titled this Numerical Methods in Economics um, is essentially the title of the course. The official title is something else. Um, but anyway, but because that's the name of the book I wrote. And uh, that's, um, I did not call it computational economics, and I don't use that phrase now much because there's a lot of people who define computational economics in different ways. So I stay away from that. And I like the phrase numerical methods in economics because what the focus of my book was and much of my research is to bring the techniques that are available in numerical analysis and bring them to economics. Now, today is gonna to be an introduction of, um, of the basic overall issues and the potential of computation. Now, the role of computation in economic analysis, um, well, there are many roles. Uh, now, the traditional one, one is, first of all, empirical analysis, running regressions, uh, maximum likelihood, um, et cetera, moment estimators. Those are often computationally intensive um, uh, exercises. The other one is applied general equilibrium has been with us for a long time. In fact, uh, this year is the 60th anniversary of the publication of Leif Johansson's um, book, which is also his PhD thesis on applied general equilibrium to um, Norway. And many people, particularly on, in Europe, regard that as the uh, beginning of computational economics. Now, there's uh, some non-traditional roles that have arisen um, more subconsciously as instead of a deliberate methodological shift is where one can use computational methods as a substitute for theory or a complement for theory. See, what, does, what is theory supposed to do? Theory, you take the assumptions in an economic model and then you use mathematical analysis, abstract math to produce uh, implications. Now, what I will argue is that uh, there's often many times where you can make assumptions and you can't, there, it's, it's very difficult if at all possible to prove some nice basic result um, about the economic nature of the implications. This is where computation has great potential in terms of uh, taking you from assumptions to implications. And we'll talk about that more, but that's a much, uh, that's very much a non-traditional role. Now, the questions that um, uh, we ask is, first of all, what can computational methods do? Um, now, we do know that a lot of computation is used. The question is, can we trust the results? And the issue of trust is a, is an important one um, because there are many people very skeptical about um, using computation because they don't trust the results. And then in general, where does computation fit into economic methodology? Where does it fit? By the way, I just got an email, a little thing floating up saying my internet connection is unstable. Um, if you are having problems with me breaking up or that, please raise your hand and tell me. Now, what's the history of computation in general? We're all aware of Moore's law for semiconductor conductors, which implied that uh, the speed of a processor CPU doubled every two years. Actually, I think the, th the claim is about something about the density at with which you can pack um, a, a chip. 
Um, and but that density then implies also roughly a doubling of speed for every two years. Now, the fact is that computational speed has been doubling, doubled through the entire 20th century. That the historical fact is that it's not just a matter for the time of semiconductors. Um, and many people argue that in the economically relevant sense, um, future technologies are going to continue that trend. That the speed of the computers that we have in front of us will double every two years. Now, those new technologies are a variety of things, three-dimensional semiconductors, asynchronous chips, optical computing, and of course, there's this big monster um, over the horizon um, that has great promise, quantum computing. Now, of course, I remember from when I was a little kid, um, uh, Hyd fusion electric fusion generate electrical power was only 30 years ahead well i've been through at least two of those 30-year horizons and still no fusion powered electricity generation some argue that the quantum computing potential is, is like that um we'll never get there but anyway it is a uh, a formidable prospect now let's see uh now the other thing about computers is that the in, in the last 20 years in particular uh, massive use of parallelism and the kind of parallelism that we're talking about is where you combine uh, many moderately powerful processors put them on communication networks and have them uh, work together now on supercomputers what you do is you take cheap processors um, but the key thing on a supercomputer is that they be very reliable. And then you put them on a fast um, backbone of uh, communications and you get your supercomputers. Another way that parallelism is implemented is where you, you take a variety of workstations or, or racks, you connect them over the ethernet. Um, now, um, in that case, the communications aren't so fast from node to node but uh this has many other advantages in particular um the ability to essentially get the computing power for free there's also in, in terms of chips gpus uh, are are something that is very popular we'll see how it pans out in the future and then fpgas are an example of some technology that people are excited about but basically there's um uh technology is moving rapidly now here's an informative picture now if you look at the um let's say the most powerful computing and now this this only goes back to i guess uh, 1940 roughly so this is basically a post-war post-world war ii line um what you see is that even before we had semiconductors, speed was increasing at, at a, um, a doubling each two years. And now when I say mainframes, that means the most powerful computers. And so as you get into the uh, 90s and the 2000s, we're tracking here the power of the most powerful supercomputers. Desktops roughly lag um the mainframes by about 20 years so my iphone today 2020 is as powerful as the super best supercomputer was in the 1990s or in 2000 uh so this uh this progress has been going on consistently now going back before if you go back to 1900 the fastest computer at that time was somebody uh, with an abacus. Um, now, you know, that's an abacus is where you have uh, little, little beads on some wires and people flipping them around. And, and the best abacus uh, person could do one floating point operations per second. 
I believe it probably was also single precision arithmetic, but it's what was used in um, marketplaces. Now, over time, even starting in the 19 teens, the 1920s, the 30s, that computing time went up. You had um, machines where you cranked them, you gave, typed in some arithmetic to do, and then you cranked it. Um, I actually saw one of those many, many years ago. It was kind of fun to play with. Uh, then somebody said, well, let's put an electric motor on it. And then, so basically, like the speed of uh, the fastest computers increased. Now, by the way, back in the 1930s, computers were defined as people who were doing computing. And by the way, the large proportion, large majority of those people were women. So you have pictures of women in big rooms uh, doing computations. Now, however, computers refer to the machines that we see. Uh, and then with the, um, and then we had uh, machines based on vacuum tubes and then transistors and CPUs, but basically over the entire 20th century, there was a doubling of speed every two years, which means roughly every decade, no, sorry, every 20 years, there's a thousand fold increase in speed. Now, Everybody knows about the rapid progress in, in hardware, but there's a lot more going on that has improved the value of computational methods and it, from the numerical analysis literature. In the past 30 years, there's been a great deal of progress in optimization, uh, linear programming um, with interior point methods, mathematical programming, nonlinear optimization, interior point methods. And then uh, some of you may have heard us talk about mathematical programming with equilibrium constraints. And the more general situate case of that is mathematical programming with complementarity constraints. These are all examples of, 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 math, of advances in the algorithms. Um, also, in terms of solving equations, um, there's been substantial progress, in particular for solving general equilibrium problems. General equilibrium problems are not, in general, they are not equations. They are really complementarity problems when you include in the possibility of a zero lower bound on, let's say, output or demand of something. And those are much more difficult equation systems to solve. Um, but in the roughly 2000 PhD thesis by Todd Munson, he created the software PATH, which can handle that. And to this day, it is based still the standard way to solve nonlinear complementarity problems and is used a lot in um, applied general equilibrium. Now, there's been also a lot of progress in symbolic mathematics, comp computational algebra. Um, now, in particular, solving systems of polynomials, Grobner bases, um, have made major progress. Um, also, there's a little thing called automatic differentiation. A lot of times, economists write down an objective function for maximum likelihood, let's say, and then they figure, well, I got to write down the derivatives. No, taking derivatives is a task that is boring. A human will often make mistakes. It's one of those mechanical tasks that should be left to the computer. And now we have lots of software that will do that for you. Now, in economics, we often want to approximate functions. Uh, value functions of dynamic programming. Um, equilibrium manifolds. Uh, and there's been great progress in that, sparse grids. Also related to this is machine learning neural, neural networks. Now, I meant these are not all of the progresses in numerical analysis. I mentioned these because these are ones that we're gonna be talking about and related to economics problems. Um, now, the software side is also made substantial progress in the last couple of decades. Um, 
economy, I think 30 years ago, or let's say 25 years ago, the dominant software used in economics was MATLAB and Gauss. And then there were old guys like me using Fortran and some others using C. Um, but now there's a much greater array of software tools, computer languages, um, that are, some of them are easier to use for people, more user-friendly. Some of them um, are uh, more powerful in a sense of computer science and languages. And I list a few here, C++, Python, and Julia. Um, I saw a presentation about a couple of weeks ago by uh, John Deutsch, who used to be, among other things, um, head of the CIA. And he was all gaga about Julia. I um, don't know why, but anyway, he, he's in love with Julia now. So there is this love affair now among many people with Python and Julia. Um, now, if you want to parallelize your tasks across processors or cores, there's MPI, OpenMP, and then even um, some supercomputer specific software like DAO that could be used in economics. Um, and actually, um, uh, Young Yang Kai and I have used, made great use of MPI. Now, on automatic differentiation, where you let the computer do the derivatives, there's Gasadi and Adimat. Uh, now, um, there's this whole business of neural nets and using neural nets, and TensorFlow is a software that's been developed to handle that. Um, now, for solving systems of polynomials, uh, there's been substantial progress in the last 20 years um, with software like Bertini, PHC Pack, Singular, Magma. So, uh, and these are all, by the way, these are things um, later in the sem semester, there'll be a lecture um, by Philip Muller on Cassati and automatic differentiation in general. Um, we're going to talk about tensors, um, also demonstrate Bertini a bit. Um, so these are things that have been used in economics and have enormous potential. Now, user-friendly interfaces are available. Ample GAMS, um, Mathematica, R, Python, Maple, they're all make it easier to use it. Now, during the course, I will be using a lot of Mathematica. However, I am not going to be using always the most powerful software tools in Mathematica um, because uh, the Mathematica experts tend to write what we used to call spaghetti code. Um, I, I don't understand what is going on. I will write, the examples I write will be written in a fashion that looks like MATLAB or Fortran or whatever, basic coding like that. Um, so I will write them up in a manner so that you can understand, um, no matter what language you have, you'll see what's going on. I'll just use simple elements of the Mathematica syntax. <laughs> the reason I like Mathematica is you can integrate text and programs easily, and I will be circulating some um, Mathematica notebooks called CDF files, which will have some examples where you can play around with them and the, the, these, you do not have to buy Mathematica for that. You can go to the Wolfram website, download the uh, CDF, search for CDF files. You can download it. That's free, easy to install. And then you can play around with some of the demonstrations that, that we have. So, um, so, so do that, but I will uh, try to avoid um, using fancy Mathematica code and hopefully if, I don't avoid that. Somebody will tell me that I need to clear things up. Now, I'm going to give you an example of one way in which the U.S. government uses computation called the NNSA. By the way, I forget what. It's something to do. Who, who cares? Nobody knows what the letters are for these things anyway. Now, the NNSA has a mandate. It, 
its mandate is to make sure that if the president of the United States wakes up in a bad mood someday and is unhappy with some group of people, that he can incinerate up to hundreds of millions of people on short notice and that the bombs will work. So that's the mandate that the NNSA has. Um, by the way, the NNSA includes the uh, computer systems that are related to the construction of nuclear bombs and now the maintenance of nuclear bombs. Um, it's called stockpile stewardship. You, know, you have a stockpile of weapons and then you stewardship. You make sure that they're healthy and going to work. And Congress said, has told them that the administrator for nuclear security will develop and carry out a plan to develop excess scale computing. Billion, billion flops. 10 to, the, uh, 10 to the 18 floating point operations per second. Now, by the way, if we go back to this picture about the, I have the mainframe and the human, and that's how I also had the human brain here. Now, back in like 2000, the, the fastest supercomputer was about a thousand times, maybe 10,000 times slower than uh, the, the human brain. So it's not surprising that, that computers have a hard time, let's say, in 2000, we have a hard time driving a car. Because driving a car requires a lot of visual processing, and that's what a lot of the human brain is focused on, is visual processing. And we do a pretty good job of it. Um, and so the fact that a computer can't is like saying, well, of course not. If you take if you scoop 99% of my gray matter out of my brain, nobody would want me driving a car or even walking or doing anything. Um, so that's a big limitation on the potential computers. However, notice that, you know, roughly 10, 20 years from now, the fastest supercomputers will surpass the human brain in terms of its computational capacity um, and then exceed it. Now, by the way, I can talk about this stuff without being too worried because I'll be gone by the time um, things really get bad for people in terms of competing with um, computers. But this is something to remember. Now, by the way, the plan is that there will be an exascale computer built um, I think the supposed date of finishing is 2021 at Argonne National Labs. So, um, which is part of this NSA business. Now, what's the reason for doing this? Well, nuclear weapon simulations must extrapolate far beyond available data. By the way, we don't have much data on nuclear weapons, particularly now that we haven't tested any of them in the, in the last 30 years. And we must predict coupled multi-scale physical phenomena that difficult to isolate in experiments, actually illegal to isolate in experiments, and therefore verification and validation is a significant unifying challenge to stockpile stewardship. Now, they take their mandate seriously. And what do they use? Well, back about 10 years ago, they had a computer called SkyBridge which to the fans of uh, uh, the Terminator movies is disturbingly similar to the name of Sky, the computer in Terminator Skynet. But of course that got obsolete, they moved up. Okay, I'm small. So I, I it broke, I, I cut out. Yeah, Karen, um, oh, it's working again? Emily say it's working again. Okay, but no slides. Oh, okay. Um, oh, you just see me, okay. Oh, there, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, technology, technology, um, uh, 
I am going to have to call our technician. Um, Ken, did you try sharing your screen? Yeah. I, oh, oh, there. So go down the bottom and share your screen. And then... Can you see me now? No. Can you see? No, it's still. So if you go down the bottom and click on share screen. This is bottom. Okay. This is bottom under Zoom. Yeah, like if you just if you just start to bring your cursor oh, down. Oh, share. Yeah, so click on that. Okay. There you go. Got okay, it. thanks. Thanks, Karen. Right. Thanks. Karen is a professor in agriculture and resource economics at um, Penn State University. And she loves telling me the story about how um, PATH uh, helped enormously on her PhD thesis. So, um, so anyway, so the, the, the supercomputer guys now have a Sierra. Now, and so, now why do I mention this? Because um, they, they mention verification and uncertainty quantification are two of the tools that have been developed along with this that have migrated into the non-nuclear world. Um, what, one thing that's important to these guys is verification. Check that your code actually solves your equations. And determine, the other one, uncertainty quantification, determine how parameter uncertainty affects results. One of my objectives is to bring these tools to economics. Um, and just as, this is just basically doing honest science. Um, now, where is economics? Uh, a well-known applied mathematician who knows economists has said economists will soon be so far behind that they will not be able to catch up. Um, and I can't say I disagree. And here's the other problem here is that economists view computers as a substitute. Computational mathematicians have a very different view. If you give computational mathematicians a computer that's 100 times faster than what they've had before, then they will begin developing algorithms that are also 100 times better than the old algorithms, and you get a net gain of 10,000. By the way, this is literally true with many um, kinds of computational problems, particularly in partial differential equations. Um, and so this is what happens. Mathematics and the computer power are complements. You improve one, and then you improve the other. Economists have the attitude that they get a computer 100 times faster than great we can forget 90% of the math we know and still get a 10 times speed up. Let me show you what the, another part of the US government does. The Federal Reserve, price stability, full employment are their mandate as well as other responsibilities. This is a phrase where I took the mandate that's given to um, the nuclear people, and I just replaced nuclear wor wor words relating nuclear bombs with economics, since dynamic economic simulations must extrapolate far beyond available data and must predict coupled multi-scale social phenomena that are difficult to isolate in experiments, then verification and validation should be a significant unifying challenge. What does the Federal Reserve use E-views. Uh, the major model at the Federal Reserve, which is taken into every FOMC meeting, is the output from the E-view, from the model called Furbis. And Furbis is based on software E-views. 
which by the way is excellent software if you want to do econometrics. It is not that good when it comes to writing up your own code to solve dynamic nonlinear equations as Ferbis is. Um, and so, um, and by the way, the Fed has been using this since the mid nineties. And at that same time, Nordhaus in his climate models was using far better software, as was the IMF and the World Bank. Um, so, anyway, so that's what we're facing. Um, now, very few economics departments offer students serious training in computational methods. Right offhand, the only example I know of is Penn State, where actually it's a required first year course or second year, the required course. Now there is one course um, that has the following mottos. Use the simplest possible methods, use methods that basically reflect the economic structure of the problem, use methods where you can watch the computations as they proceed, and use one dimensional algorithms as much as possible. Uh, as you might be able to guess, I think these are all ridiculous um, uh, man, uh, suggestions. Now, one reason I spend time on these things is many of you have seen seminars or get taken courses or lectures where you're told certain things about computation. I am gonna contradict much of what you are supposed to, should have supposed to have learned, and um, and now some people say you cannot trust the computations done in economic papers, and they're correct. I don't trust uh, economic computations because they don't use the best possible methods. They don't do verification, um, and they don't do uncertainty quantification, which means I don't trust the economic messages. Now I'll give you some examples, and this is related to things that we are gonna be talking about. One of the first things we'll be doing is optimization. Now the conventional wisdom is that nothing's happened in, in optimization algorithms for 45 years that would be useful in economics. Also, um, there are people um, that dismiss the importance of automatic differentiation, and then you also say, oh, stay away from magical black boxes. Here's my reply to that. Bob Wilson's 1964 PhD, which was by, by the way, not in economics, but was in the Harvard Applied Math Department, introduced something called sequential quadratic programming, which is a key style of constrained optimization that's used today. <coughs> Interior point methods. Very powerful methods, very popular. They were first proposed by Ragnar Frisch. But at that time, computers and the linear algebra software um, weren't available to implement them. Now, on automatic differentiation, Bob Hall, and this was, I believe, I don't know, in the mid 60s, he wrote TSP. And um, and he implemented what we would now call automatic differentiation. My impression of talking to him is he doesn't, didn't know it, but that's what he did. And because doing finite dif difference derivatives is not a good idea, and he basically, um, in first versions of TSP and later versions also, they have automatic differentiation. Now the magical black boxes com comment always infuriates me because a, block, a box ceases to be black when you open your eyes and turn on the lights. And that's what we're gonna be doing. Structural estimation is one part of computational economics where uh, the conventional wisdom is, oh, the computational challenges are high, we have to, there was a popular phrase about 15 years ago, computationally light estimators. You don't see it much anymore. Um, um, I don't know if I can take credit for that, but it wasn't, I did 
start ridiculing it about 15 years ago um, and others. So now also within empirical IO, they love the Nelder Mead algorithm, the Nelder Mead algorithm. They love that one, which by the way is called amoeba in numerical recipes. And um, an amoeba is a slug with no brain. Um, and that's a good name for the Nelder Mead algorithm. And then you have many times in papers in Econometrica, they assert that estimation requires solving for all equilibrium for each parameter value. And then this is a difficult task for estimating games because there may be multiple equilibria. Now, this is false and shown by several papers, by, mainly by Chaylin Su and some of his co authors. Dynamic programming. Again, people seem to think you can't do high dimensional dynamic programming, but you can. Um, heterogeneous agent models are thought to be difficult, um, but yeah, it is if you're gonna stick with the, um, let's say the Crusell Smith approach and others, but when you, but many have used serious mathematics to do much better. Um, dynamic games, again, uh, the conventional wisdom is that solving feedback equilibrium, Markov perfect equilibrium is difficult. But the reason is that many people just limit themselves to Gauss, Seidel and Gauss, Jacobi methods. By the way, all of those authors have long been dead and the living have produced much better ways of solving nonlinear equations. And then also the multiplicity issue can be handled by homotopy methods as, now, by the way, I, I'm not listing the papers here that I'm pointing, uh, there's a lot of papers I'm pointing to implicitly here. As we go along, you'll, you'll see the papers. Now, also economists stay away from massively parallel systems. Uh, they claim they, their attitude is it's difficult to use them. Now, that was the case, let's say, 25 years ago. Um, in the early 90s, I, and along with many economists, were, was invited to go to a seminar at the Champaign-Urbana supercomputer. I don't know the name of it, but it was at that time the flagship NSF supercomputer in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. And the guy in charge of it wanted economists to use the machine. Um, however, none of us, I think maybe John Rust used it a bit, but the rest of us just didn't because the, the only language you could use is Fortran, which is fine with me, but you had to have you got had to be an expert in a brand of Fortran that was built for that machine, and so the thing is when the next the connection machine is what it was called, CM five as I recall, when that machine dies and is replaced by somebody else, the software was that you learned was totally useless. Now, however, there is standardization in the software in Fortran compilers and high power computing. So it's not so difficult to get on, to use them if you get on them. Also MPI and OpenMP makes, is, is standard, is a standard and you can get, you can use it much rather easily and transportable across computers. Now, some people may say that you can't get access to supercomputers. Well, over the past seven years, I got 1.4 million node hours. And each node was either um, eight or, or 16 cores. So anyway, it was at least 10 million core hours up to 20, depending on what node was chosen. But 1.4 million node hours that I was able to get um, from Blue Waters. And one reason I was able to get it is because um, the allocations they gave me were teeny tiny compared to the allocations that the physicists were getting so they could throw a few, throw a little crumb off the table for economists. I believe in those seven years, I was the only economist on those machines. 
Now in Switzerland, Swiss researchers doing economics have access to PISDATE, which is the fastest supercomputer in Europe. Now, are these useful in economics? Well, a recent paper that I wrote that appeared in JPE in December, last December, um, the only way that that analysis could be done was with supercomputers. Now, the fact is that there are multiple ways to get substantial computer power. I'll talk about them um, as the uh, course proceeds. Now, also, this is an example of where you, some things where the participants can help. Um, so now, for obvious reasons, I know what's available in the U.S. But, you know, that's only for Americans, typically. Now then, um, um, Carl Schmetters and his students, they know what's available in Switzerland. But the Swiss, um, you know, again, there's a share. That they kind of reserve it for the Swiss as a natural tendency. But now, those of you in Germany, find out what's available in Germany. And by the way, with, super, with, the, with these things, don't go to the official website and look at the application process because you'll see that it's impossible to get time to fill those requirements. What you've got to do is find some back door. And that's how I got time on Blue Waters. There was a back door there. There was some, um, some special uh, program for universities that were in the Midwest in particular Big Ten universities and some other Midwestern universities, that they had a privileged access or a backdoor access to, to get time without fulfilling the normal requirements. Now, my suspicion is that this is always true. In all of these computers, there's, you gotta find out if there's some, if your university has a connection of some sort with a supercomputer, then perhaps there's a backdoor through them. So that's how I got on Blue Waters, is finding a back door. Actually, a, a physicist, Bob Rosner, told me about the back door. I'm always really grateful for him about that. So, so this is what, in order to get on these machines, you have to um, sort of um, dig into the bureaucracy and find out what's available and what the back doors are. With. Because the the physicists are going to be able to go in the front door and we can't compete with them but there's some back doors hopefully or find out if they want to support non-traditional users of uh, um econ econ uh, supercomputing and then the, of course we're in that group so you've got to sort of play that game and if if any of you in germany or netherlands or norway or wherever have information about something that's not well known, tell us and hopefully share it with us. Um, now, this is a picture of the machine that we use, Blue Waters. And, and you know, we visited it once and yeah, it's a big room in a big building, but most of the building is devoted to the cooling system because these things eat up a lot of power, they generate a lot of heat. And so you have to have enormous cooling systems. Now, polynomial equations and systems of polynomials are regarded as being difficult to solve. And so that's why in much of economics, particularly let's say uh, IO theory, uh, the problems are always linear demand and linear supply curves. Um, because linear things can be solved. Um, but Higher, higher order polynomial systems can also be solved. Um, that goes back um, at the, Hilbert had a variety of challenges that he um, set out at the beginning of the 20th century and the null Stolensatz um, uh, was one of them. And later in the 20th century, uh, Grobner came up with the Buchberger algorithm, which is it and its improvements are in use today. And now the software developments of the last 20 years um, have been great to allow this. And actually I'm involved in a project with TJ Cannon, at, who's at now at University of Texas, to use massively parallel architectures. So we're confident we can solve some 
um, some big high order um, polynomial systems equations with that. Um, numerical integration. Typically you're told, oh, you gotta use Monte Carlo methods for multidimensional integrals. And by the way, um, multidimensional is, when you ask them is roughly anything over two dimensions. And some economists will point to this Bakhvalov paper and say, approve the intractability of integration. And they think Monte Carlo integration is good enough for economic, econometrics. Well, if you read Bakhvalov and go beyond section one, you will see that he also showed other theorems about some uh, classes of functions where you did not have the cursor dimensionality. So it's only section one of that paper that has this very pessimistic message. The other uh, rest of the paper is optimistic. Um, now, by the way, um, I can't say I read the paper. Um, it was written in, in, in 1959, published in a Russian journal. And uh, those papers have not been translated um, officially. Um, I think after 1960, um, I was told that Russian math papers were typically translated to English. Not this, but fortunately, I ran into, over, over time, ran into a couple of Russians uh, who got me the copy of the paper and then the, between the two of them, they translated it into English. Um, so, um, now I dare not post it publicly because there's two copyright problems with with that but anyway um <coughs> i certainly could share it in sort of snail mail fashion but but anyway there's also other people stroud many other people that have tractable methods for numerical integration and i will point you to that literature in particular there will be an example that um, will be discussed where using uh, stuff from stroud um greatly enhanced the quality of an economy of solving blp problems a very common problem in uh empirical io so we'll talk about that now over time i've had two great questions and perhaps some of you are asking yourself the same question um in fact at, the last time i taught my course at chicago it was at this perfect time when a student raised his hand and asked, if economics is so hostile to computational science, why am I taking this course? My answer to him is, you wanna do sound research. As an economist, you do the computations and verify the results, but then you focus on the economics in describing it. Now, are people gonna ask you about how you got those results? doubtful that they will ask you and so don't bring it up you know it's in an appendix people don't read the papers so they certainly are never going to read an appendix so the point here and this is the focus of the course use computation to do economics i'm not going to teach you how to prove new theorems about and new methods in computation just use what's out there and and then do the economics that's the point here. Now, one student asked me once when I was talking about how awful the literature was in economics, asked me, well, when I read a paper, how, how can I tell if, it, if I can trust it? I thought that was an excellent question and um, it took me um, a little while to come up with the answer, but the answer was I came up with was, check to see if they cite papers written by experts in computational math. If somebody says, oh, they have this great way to solve nonlinear equations, but they make no mention of, let's say like Newton's method or methods for solving nonlinear equations, and they just write down their procedure, and which probably is gonna be Gauss, a version of Gauss-Seidel, but they don't tell you that they're using Gauss-Seidel. If they don't cite any math literature, then, uh, then that's, that's a big warning. 
<coughs> that they probably aren't do, don't know what they're doing. And um, no, I always will cite the math. Most economists won't and can't. Um, now, the other thing is, I had an experience where I asked a macroeconomist, he was giving a plenary talk at a macro conference. And he was talking about, oh, um, sparse optimization, sparseness methods. Well, sparseness methods are very popular right now, very, a lot of developments over the last 20 years. I couldn't see the connection between the, he was using the same jargon, the same phrases as used in the math literature, but I didn't see the connection. Um, so I asked him to describe the relations between what he's doing and how he's applying these ideas from the math literature. He said, we should talk about this after my talk because you are the only person who will understand my answer. Um, which I thought was a refreshingly honest or candid answer. Now, some of the roughly 200 macroeconomists in the room did understand that he had insulted them. So, so this is, this is um, again, another example of how you know, asking computational questions of these guys is often done for entertainment, not for um, really to get serious information. Now, what can we compute now? We can do a very good job at dynamic optimization, optimal control, dynamic programming. Um, mechanism design, contracting, optimal taxation, nonlinear pricing um, are now far more tractable than they were even 10 years ago. Um, on the optimal taxation side of things, uh, Chaylin Su and I worked on um, trying to solve multi-dimensional optimal tax problems. So these are taxes problems like, like Murley's, except instead of people differing only in one dimension, labor productivity, we said suppose they differ on labor productivity, suppose they differ on the elasticity of labor supply, suppose they differ in terms of their utility function over consumption, suppose they differed, differed on um, their age. Um, anyway, so um, what that means, by the way, you see, every optimal mechanism design paper that I've seen that relies on what's called the single crossing property, but that's only valid if you have a one-dimensional heterogeneity in types. Um, you go to multidimensional and that's not valid anymore. So if you have N types of people and then you have all these incentive compatibility constraints, you have N squared incentive compatibility constraints. Um, and the result is that the shadow prices are not going to be unique because you could have far more of those incentive compatibility constraints binding than you have um, uh, choice variables, which means the shadow prices at the solution are going to be non-unique, um, and which means that no conventional solver, optimization solver, can solve the problem because all of the good software out there assumes that there's a unique shadow price at the solution. Now, Chaylin and I just, we got hung up on that. I mentioned this at a conference a couple of years ago and happened to have Michael Saunders, a computational math guy in the audience. And he says, Ken, oh, you can easily deal with this by some proximal perturbation or some relaxation. I forget what buzzword he used. And I said, okay, let's talk about it. So we did talk about it. We met, we met um, many times in the next fall um, with, I met with Michael and a student of his, Dingma. It turned out these simple approaches didn't work well. And so then um, we kind of, I thought we had given up. But then, the, then uh, the, this is the fall of 2017, I get an email from Michael, including a paper with my name on it by him and Digma and a fourth person, a mathematician, 
computational computer, which solves that problem. And one of the examples that we had had over half a million nonlinear constraints, and it's solved in four hours on a single core processor. So this is an example also of how getting in getting the professionals involved can be an enormous help. What I like when is when um, when I tell these guys, oh, I can't use your software to solve it, and then they say, oh, no, no, it's, their attitude is, oh, you dumb economists don't know how to use it. Um, but then uh, I know enough to realize that. Uh, there's something serious there, so I challenge them to do it, and we get good research out of it. Um, and, uh, and, and it's often the case, I don't know, Carl has an example where he sent a problem to some, some computational guys. He said, oh yeah, we could easily solve it. And he didn't hear from them for about a month or two. He asked them, he said, well, we can't solve it. The thing is that the numerical analysis literature he is focused on problems that arise naturally in the physical sciences or operations research. And there are often uh, economics problems which have unique mathematical features that make those algorithms fail. And so this, but this is then a challenge to them. Um, and, and this can often be very useful and helpful because these guys want to help us. There's no question. These guys want to help us. Uh, the problem is most economists don't know how to talk to these guys because they'll, um, and this, for those of you who um, in the future may want to show me um, uh, their uh, research and get my comments, um, my rule always is um, don't talk to me about the math about the economics. Don't talk about the economics. Describe things in, a, in the mathematical sense. An example of that, I was at a conference once many years ago with uh, um, pa um, Ariel Pacas. And he says, Ken, can you, maybe you can help me with this problem, computational problem. I said, okay, fine. And he starts yakking away about the economics. And I said, I don't want to hear any economics. That's not important. I said, this is a constrained optimization problem, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, it's a constrained optimization problem. Okay, so what's the constraint? Is it convex, concave, is it smooth? Uh, it's linear, was his answer. Okay, what about the constraints? Are they, is it a convex set, non-convex set? And I said, oh, the constraints are linear. And I said, well, gee, even MATLAB, I think, has a pretty decent linear programming module. And he says, well, his RA wants to use F min con, which in those days was pretty bad. Um, so that's the key thing is um, you start telling somebody your economic story, your economics intuition, that, that he's not going to be able to help at all. And that, that applies even when, whenever you're talking to me about your stuff, think of me in that way too. Because I, there's some parts of economics I'm familiar with well, but, but not everything. And also by thinking about it in that way, it helps to discipline you and helps to focus you on what the right um, way to think about things are. General equilibrium, there's been great progress on that. Um, games, substantial progress on that. Um, a couple of years ago, Shabin Yeltikin, Young and Kai and I uh, published a paper on operations research on how to solve infinitely repeated games with state variables. Um, again, something which absolutely required supercomputer power. Econometrics, uh, we can do, a, a, you know, there's a standard things, maximum likelihood method moments, Bayesian methods, um, and now the MCMC tools that have been developed are very useful for many things. And now Gregor Reich and I are working on um, uh, how to how to use the level sets of likelihood functions or moment criteria in to do inference as opposed to the uh, standard local uh, quadratic approximations. So um, there's things we can do now, and a lot of it is because we have a lot more computational power than we had, as well as improvements in the math.
Now, why am I doing this? Well, not for money, not for fame. The other thing, but who, who else is doing this? Nobody else is doing it, so if I don't do it, who will? The key thing is economics needs researchers who know computational science and the tools and the methods. I need RAs and postdocs. And so I view this as a way to get acquainted with um, graduate students um, throughout the world. And perhaps um, if, if I get my hands on some money, then I'll have um, some pool of potential helpers. Why are you here? Well, I presume you have realized that this is the best way to use your time. I'm glad to see that. You want to do, you want to learn computational methods, you want to do solid path breaking research. Also, the other thing is I'm hoping that this can also create networking opportunities among the students. Um, and this was certainly a, a positive thing about um, the ICE conferences that um, I used to run the years ago. So hopefully this will create spontaneously some of that networking. And you also might like to spend time in sunny California that occasionally happens to students I work with. Now, here's the theme of the theme, one of the themes of this course, basic themes. Economic modeling is really applied math. Describe your models using mathematical terminology, language, so you know, and then you know what kind of problem you have. Use the most reliable and accurate methods. They also tend to be the fastest, or certainly far faster than the simple methods that come from economic intuition. Now, you don't need to become experts <coughs> on the nitty gritty details of these methods. But, see, the most important thing about learning a method or a software package is not so much how to use it um, to give it a problem and then it works wonderfully, you have to know enough so that when it doesn't work, you have some understanding of what's going on so that you can figure out why it didn't work. So um, that's why when I talk about constrained optimization algorithms, I'll give you some basic ideas of how um, the algorithms work. I'm not gonna prove any theorems, um, but I'll give you some idea of what's going on and then that and that will help you understand how to change your code in order to get, uh, in order to improve and improve and get to something that will work. Now, economists should not spend their time develop or coding up algorithms. I know there's a lot of economists love to do that because they, I don't know, really wish they were computer scientists or whatever. Um, but the theme here is, you know, do that on your own. I'm not. I don't think that's a um, terribly useful activity. It certainly, I mean, basically everything I've done is just using what this the algorithms that's out there and, and then piecing things together so that they work for economics problems. Um, so I always recommend use professionally written software and then focus on your job doing the economics. Now, Another theme is do not trust the results you get from any software. Verify their accuracy. Dovrier, no provrier. That's I'm sure horrible Russian as some of you probably immediately realized. But the phrase is uh, trust, but verify. Which of course means you don't really trust it in the first place, but you, maybe it's hope and verify. Hope that you can trust the results, but then verify they come out. Now, verification is a key step in modern computational science. Um, and again, something that's been developing along with uh, computational engineering and variety of things. Verification, you have equations and then you get answers from computer and you wanna check to see whether you really do have an acceptable solution. See, every computation is going to be wrong. Every solution is going to have errors. The question is, how big are those errors? And is that error tolerable given your objective? 
in economics problems that, you know, is that error, let's say you're doing supply equals demand equilibrium, and you find that, well, supply doesn't equal equi demand, but is the error small enough so that you can think that it, defend it as being, a, 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 the error is of economic um, noise and not really important and can be ignored. So that's what I will also be talking about as we proceed. How do you verify the result? Now, use the most powerful hardware you can get. Power makes debugging go much faster. It allows you to handle larger problems. And it also gives you the power to do serious verification. In that December JPE paper, one of the contributions I regard is that we did implement um, extensively verification. We had to do basically, a, it was a non-stationary dynamic program problem, so we had to compute value functions starting 600 years out and iterating backwards. And we came up with a procedure to verify that, that if you're at time t and you have a value function and you want to compute the value function at time t minus one, we computed basically an upper bound on the errors in the value function and the policy functions for time t minus one and then proceeded. Um, now, by the way, the other thing that's kind of popular buzzword is open source. Um, share the code. Yeah, well, what good is the code to me if, if you've written it in Urdu or some other computer language or style that I have no way of understanding? And so sharing the code is not that useful. Um, now, in that December paper, uh, for a variety of reasons, we were not going to share the code. And also, we, we literally could not share the code because um, it had a lot of copyrighted pieces to it. So we couldn't post the code publicly. And so we told JPE, no, no go on that. Or I should say, Young Yang told them we couldn't, and I wrote the letter, but anyway. Um, so um, what we did instead is we provided them with Mathematica toolboxes that and also we get with this we gave them solutions and we gave them the basically the first order equations for the optimization problems in mathematica and so they could they could they had the solutions they could use them to do simulations they also could check the validity of each step and so that's what we provided software which they could use to use the results for simulations and then they could verify that the solutions were accurate. Now, that is something that um, I think is far more useful, particularly in a case where nobody has access to the machines that could run the code anyway, but at least they could do it in this, they could do this. Um, now, this is my hope for the future of computation and economics. Just look at, the, look at it from an economics point of view. Computing costs, are gonna to continue to decrease. Now, by the way, this whole business of talking about floating point operations per second is not the, it's something the engineers focus on, it's something we all understand, but what really measures computational power is the cost of giga, one gigaflop. What's the cost, dollar cost? of a gigaflop or a teraflop. What's the cost? That cost is coming down faster than, than just what's predicted by Moore's law. And, and, and now then when you combine it with the uh, improvements in software, um, the cost of computing power is dropping rapidly. Everybody else is using it, but not economics. Now, uh, hopefully economists can catch up to the frontiers um, and even interact with the computational mathematicians to improve that. Now, here's the basic economic points. What, what are the inputs into re economic research? You have human time and you have the computers. And the, uh, the goal 
of the research is to understand economic systems. Com computational power relative to the cost of human time is coming down rapidly. So just simple comparative advantage principles say that humans should special, specialize in what they are good at, and that is relatively good at, relative to the computer. They focus on formulating economic concepts and formulating the models, and then let the computers do the tedious tasks of going from assumptions and theories to the implications. A lot of that can be done quickly and reliably with computational tools today. Not 40, not 40 years ago, or 50 years ago, I was taking a course, uh, I'd say 48 years ago, I was taking a course in physics and we did a new computation. What did we use? We use something called the slide rule. And I bet that the younger part of this crowd doesn't even know what a slide rule is or maybe saw it in a museum. But that was the computational tool I had then. And when I was doing my PhD thesis at Wisconsin, what computing power did I have access to? Not, not much, it was. And, and then when I was assistant professor at Northwestern, I did do some, Computing, which is today you know, regarded as trivial, but 40 years ago, we didn't have access to the computational power that we do now. So therefore, we need to shift sort of the relative inputs into the economic research production function, and this means using computation. Now, that is the end of my prepared comments. Um, are there any comments or questions, reaction 